Good morning and welcome to Real Life Ministries. We are so excited that you are joining us online. We are about to get ready to worship in just a few minutes, but before we do, I wanna remind you of a couple things. Don't forget to download our Real Life Ministries app. We have a ton of stuff happening here at Real Life and the app is the best way for you to stay connected all throughout the week. It has our sermon notes as well as a place to give. And if you make a decision today, you can do that right on our app. And so it is an incredible resource. So make sure that you have it downloaded. Also, I would love to know where you're watching from. I am at our Post Falls campus here in North Idaho. It's actually sunny and beautiful outside. It has been an amazing weekend. So I'd love to know where are you watching from and what did you do this weekend? So we have a ton of volunteers and staff ready to chat with you online. So if you have any questions, prayer requests, you can drop those in the chat or you can email us at info at reallifeministries.com. Again, we wanna help you stay connected, answer any questions and be praying with you. All right, we are in our last uh, sermon of our series, Home Wreckers. This has been a phenomenal series. We have been talking about healthy relationships and how do we have those. And so today, Keith Strasberger is bringing the word. He did an incredible job last service. He's talking about unforgiveness. And we all know that unforgiveness is going to ruin some sort of relationship. And so God has just been working through him and he shares a part of his story and it is so good. So again, I'm excited that you are tuning in. Now, don't forget Easter is just around the corner and we are so excited because that means the Easter egg hunt is coming. Not only the Easter egg hunt, but we get to celebrate, right? The resurrection of Jesus. And so this is the perfect time to invite your family, friends, coworkers, anyone who might be like, man, this is a time where I would be interested in checking out what real life is all about. And so again, we have the Easter egg hunt and with that, we need candy, lots and lots of candy. We're gonna fill our fields with as much candy as we can, Easter eggs, and let the kids go crazy in an organized, chaotic kind of way. And so it is a really fun event and just a really cool way to bless our community. So next time you're at the store, grab a bag of candy. You can drop it off at any of our locations, North Campus, Coeur d'Alene Campus, or Post Falls Campus. Um, and again, we're at like four and a half barrels. And so we need 70, or no, it's not 70, 24 barrels of candy to be filled. So we still have a little ways to go. Also, we would love to have you volunteer at this event. It is a super fun time to volunteer and just to get connected. So if you are interested, you can text the word volunteer to 208-449-0234. And again, we would love to have you be a part of that team. So we're about to get ready to worship. Grab your Bible, a cup of coffee, find your seat, and thanks for joining us.
to welcome to Real Life Ministries. How are you guys doing today? Awesome. Are you excited to be here? We are glad to have you. A few things before we get started. If you've not downloaded the Real Life Ministries app, you're going to want to pull out your phone and do that right now. And here's why. It's the best way to stay connected during service and after service. On the app, you will find our bulletin, you'll find upcoming events and ways to get connected here at Real Life. This morning, we have the opportunity to turn our hearts from our busy mornings and turn them to God and focus on His goodness and what He's done for us. This morning, we're gonna worship through communion, prayer, and giving, but first we're gonna worship through song. The first song we're gonna sing together is The Father's House. Will you stand with me and pray? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord. Our hearts are ready to worship you. Lord, open our minds and our hearts. We love you, Lord. You're a good, good God. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing sometimes. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. Looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. And fail you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Fail you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Sing it out. of what he does. Prodigals come home, the helpless find hope, the love is on the move when the father's in the room. Prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life, the love is on the move when the father's in the room. The miracles take place, the cynical find
can stand against the power of our God and almighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our God you shine in the shadows you win every battle nothing can stand against the Praise God. You can grab a seat. Aren't you grateful that the battle does belong to our God? Amen. And the things that we're going through, that, that He is the one that's carrying it. He's the one fighting it, and we get to fight on our knees in prayer and worship, and that's what we're doing right now, right? And we're going to continue in worship in just a moment, but right now, if you would just take a second to let us know that you're here joining us uh, by texting in your attendance. Super helpful for us. If you would text the word here, if you're joining us at the Post Falls campus, and if you're watching online, we're grateful that you're joining us and staying connected with us. If you would text the word online to the number on your screen, that'd be super helpful. Just again, grateful that you can stay connected with us. And if you are new, either in person or online, would you just text the word new to the number on your screen? Can we just give it up for the new people for a minute here? 
Man, what a step of faith. And on daylight savings time, that is a big deal. Way to go for being here at 845, 945. Super cool. So grateful that we're able to join together. There are so many things happening here, and that's why it's helpful to, to stay connected by texting in your attendance. We want to give you guys an update on our Easter egg hunt that's happening April 3rd at 4 and 8 p.m. You guys have raised four and a half barrels of candy, and 77 of you have stepped up to serve. That's something to celebrate. But our work is not done. To pull off these Easter egg hunts, we need 200 volunteers and 24 barrels of candy. And we wanna be a blessing to our community and welcoming to these families that are gonna come. So here's what we need from you. We need 133 more of you to sign up to serve and we need to fill those 19 and a half barrels. And just so you know, a barrel I counted takes 13 Costco bags of candy. So let's do that together. If you want to sign up to serve, you can do so online at reallifeministries.com slash egg hunt, or you can text volunteer to the number on the screen or head out to the lobby to sign up. I also want to tell you about our Easter services. This year on the Post Falls campus, we're going to have six services. We're going to have two on Saturday, four on Sunday. So we've provided invitations for you because we know you're praying and planning about who you want to invite. They've got all the service details and the Easter egg hunt information. You can grab them on your way out of the auditorium. Awesome. Can't believe Easter is almost here. Man, three weeks away. So thanks for helping with that. Hey, we want to let you know, uh, as we end our sermon series, Home Wreckers, today, and we get ready to kind of enter our Easter series, uh, we have a variety of tools. You may have been challenged through this series to take a step in some direction. Or maybe you're like, you know, I, I need help with something. We have a variety of classes that are coming up that start the week after Easter. We have marriage classes. We have blended family classes. We have parenting. Uh, we have finance classes. We have a variety of things. So you may be challenged, but go, here's a step that you can take to be equipped. So I want to let you know about those. Check those out on the website there, reallifeministries.com slash classes. But again, a tool for you to take that next step of growth. Right now, we're going to move into our time of giving. And this is an act of worship. It's saying to the Lord, I trust you with everything you have given me. And I, I want to trust and build your kingdom, not my own. And so you can give lots of different ways uh, on our website, slash give. You can give it through our app. And you can also give through boxes that we have around campus for cash or check. But everything that comes in through the ministry here goes to real ministry in our community, in our church. To do things together, we wouldn't be able to do on our own, like the Easter egg hunt, right? that we're able to do these things in our community, to bless our community, to really make God's name great, to point to him and not our own kingdom and our own things. We're going, God, I trust you. So thank, thanks for your faithfulness and your generosity to be able to build his kingdom. And it's through that generosity, through, through our giving, through our serving, through discipleship, that we get to see lives changed here at Real Life every single week and God is doing amazing things. We get to celebrate last week, listen to this, 11 more baptisms, 11, man. And here, here's what baptism is. It's a picture of going public with that decision that they've made individually. It's, it's showing the world the decision that they've made to make Jesus their Lord and Savior. And it's a, it's a declaration of, of the death, burial and resurrection that Jesus has done in our life, the things that he is doing. And this is not that finish line. This is the starting point of saying, I am all in. I am trusting God with my life. And we love seeing all the people that come around and support these baptisms in discipleship. This is why we exist, church, to reach the world for Jesus one person at a time. And we have a baptism right now. Come on, let's cheer for him. Good morning, Real Life. Uh, this is Jordan. Uh, Jordan and I got to spend some time this last week and just talk about life, talk about being a husband, being a father, talking about being a follower of Jesus. And Jordan, I want to ask you, are you in this water right now because you are fully surrendered? You want to follow Jesus with all your heart? Yes. And you're, you're committed to following him with everything you've got, um, and you're going to allow Jesus to change your heart and be transformed? And in, and in doing that, you sit, you're sitting in this water today because you want to be on mission with, with God, yes. which means whatever God is up to, I want to be part of that. Yes. 
All right. Well, I'm proud of you. Um, and I'm going to ask you some questions. And uh, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God? Yes. And do you believe that he came to this earth as a human being, lived a sinless life, and died on the cross for your sins? Yes. And you believe that he rose again on the third day? Yes. All right. Well, I'm gonna, um, we're going to get this going then. I'm going to have you plug your nose. And I'm going to say on, upon your confession then that we baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Praise God. What a great way to kick off our service. Hey, we're continuing our Home Wreckers series right now, and Keith Strasberger is coming out to talk about forgiveness and unforgiveness and that challenge uh, in our life. Shannon, would you pray for us? Lord, thank you for today. Father, I pray for Keith as he comes out to share the message you've given him. Give us open minds and open hearts to hear your word and know how to apply it to our lives. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Searching for sun, but you're praying for rain. Looking for love, but you push it away. Like a time bomb under the surface. Good morning, real life. Wow. It's nice outside, huh? That's what I'm thinking. Well, we are finishing up our Home Wreckers series. What a name, Home Wreckers. But there's a thing, I want to do a, a quick review of what we've covered. And those Home Wreckers were, were, were working from the perspective of what we call the home sphere and the different spheres or different uh, lives we have. So my, my, my abiding spheres that in, in each of us that are followers of Jesus, that time that I spend abiding with the Lord Jesus Christ. Abiding means to stay with, continue, engage, listen to, connect with Jesus. And out of those, at that time of Jesus, then I have my, my home sphere or my home life. And your home might be uh, your, your spouse and kids. Maybe you don't have a spouse or kids, but it's your roommate or, or those in your close circle. Every one of us has a close circle of people in our sphere of influence. Then there's our work sphere or our work life. That, that, that how we live, that's born out of our time with Jesus in that, in that life as well. And then there's our church life. And all of us don't just go to church. You guys know this. We are the church. So how, what's my life look like it, being, being the church? And my, my serving, my, my, my giving, my giving of my time, resources, finances, intellect, abilities, caring for others, being connected in group and relationship with others, being honest and, and living out what Jesus has set for me as I depend on him. Again, it goes back to abiding. But where our focus is right now, always our focus is going to be abiding with Jesus. Because whatever happens there, that's where everything pours out of it. We're, we've been focusing on our home sphere. What happens at home? How do I live at home? How do I live with the people that I'm closest to? And so we, that's why we called it home wreckers. And there's certain things that are home wreckers. And every one of us has experienced them and probably done them. Well, I'm not say probably. And have done them. And they've impacted us whether we're the, we're the giver or receiver of these home wreckers. And we start off with pride. Pride is sort of the, the, the one bookend. And every one of you, myself included, have been in, in, impacted um, negatively because of someone's or some people's pride. And there have been people that have been impacted negatively because of your pride. And so pride is a home wrecker. And, and Jim started us off with that. And the next one was poor communication. And communication, this isn't the words we use. It's how, how I behave or act or the look or the body language. And uh, I know that's been a, a disaster for me at times, uh, how I communicate by with just how I look. And I, I just, you know, I think back raising boys and, man, the looks I gave my boys, I just regret if I could take some of those back. And I didn't even have to say a word and it's just how I looked at them, and, uh, or my spouse. And I don't even have to say anything, but I can, I can sure get a lot across that way. Well, poor communication can be a home wrecker or un unthoughtful communication or careless communication. Then we talked about wrong priorities the next week. 
And I know that my priorities, the things that I have made first and that, that drive my life have hurt a lot of people when, they, when they've been wrong, when they've been outside of Jesus. And I've been impacted by people's wrong priorities, as you, as you have as well. And then, was, uh, last week was uh, untrustworthy. And each of us being trustworthy and, and how untrustworthiness can be a home wrecker. It's hard to live with somebody that, that, that consistently lets me down. I'm not saying I live with somebody. Christine's sitting over there. She doesn't let me down. But I've been in those situations where that's, it's consistent. It's like, okay, you, you know it's baloney, but it's going to. And it, the impact, I have been untrustworthy as a friend, as a father, as a husband. And, and it, it's cost me and others. Well, then the other book in we're going to finish with is that's a definite home wrecker. I would say is a church wrecker, is a life wrecker, but we're focused on home, is resentment and unforgiveness. And so I want you guys to hear this. Everything I say tonight, this morning, there is no condemnation. I just know every single one of you, myself included, standing on the stage, um, wrestles with or gives into unforgiveness or resentment. And, it, and none of us escape that one. And it is a lifestyle, a lifelong pursuit of giving up what I'm withholding forgiveness for and my resentment. And if you don't think you're resentful, here's what I did. I thought, man, I think I've got this. I was actually working on this sermon for the last couple of weeks. And I, and I go, Lord, show me where I'm resentful or withholding unforgiveness. And because God loves me so much, he showed me. And, it, and, and there's no condemnation. I'm like, oh, I'm an idiot. I can't believe it. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I, it's there. And, it's, and, and so I've had to go talk to several people and go, you know, I've been resenting you. And whether they did anything or not, it doesn't matter. I've been holding this. And so I see, uh, I, I see resentment and unforgiveness. And I, I can't think of a, uh, it's not a good word, but it's like a cancer. And it just eats things alive in the home. Maybe the person you're sitting next to that you, you resent. It, you're, you know, in, in church, you know, I had a, a person, this is, gosh, seven, eight, nine weeks, I don't know how long ago. It was, it was earlier this year, and uh, maybe it was last year, and I was uh, preaching, and they came up to me later and goes, I need to ask your forgiveness. First, I need to forgive you. And I'm like, okay. It was something that I said 15 years ago. Now, this person I've had coffee with, I hug, we laugh, and that whole time this person was resenting me and had unforgiveness towards me that was very hurtful to this person. I had no idea. And so it was more for them than for me. I was glad that it was out in the air. But the relief and the freedom that this person had because they finally put it on the table. So now when this person sits down with me and gives me a hug, they're not grinding their teeth, they're not resenting me. It takes a lot of energy, doesn't it? You know, I was looking at pride, poor communication, wrong priorities, priorities lack of trust, worthiness, and, uh, and unforgiveness. I'm thinking of Jesus. And Jesus is the very opposite of all those. And so I think of Jesus, he's the very opposite of pride. And scripture tells us that Jesus Christ who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself a servant. It says that in Philippians chapter 2. And he came to earth, and he gave up his privileges as God, the creator of the universe, the creator of mankind, and became like one of us. That wasn't pride that sent him here. It was humility. The God of the universe humbled himself on our behalf. So I look at pride, poor communication. Jesus was not a poor communicator. He, he communicated everything he meant and intended to do in word and deed. He lived it out. That's why he was able to say, um, as I have loved you, so love one another. You want to know what forgiveness looked like? He lived it out in front of people's very eyes all the way to the cross and his death and then even his resurrection. Wrong priorities. Jesus didn't have wrong or selfish priorities. Who in the world would do what Jesus did for a bunch of people who don't even care and most won't even re most won't even respond to what he did throughout whole history most people don't respond and they reject and run or mock or have nothing to do with what Jesus did or who he is and the fact that he's God and he went to the cross he took their punishment but his priorities were dialed in and again razor sharp 
lack of trustworthiness. Jesus is, is and was and always will be absolutely trustworthy. What he says is what he says. Who he is is who he is. And then we're going to come to forgiveness. And Jesus modeled and lives forgiveness. So if we're gonna if we're gonna talk about unforgiveness and what that means, we need to just spend a little bit of time in what forgiveness is. And so, real quick, Jesus Christ. I just got done quoting uh, Philippians chapter two. Jesus Christ is God. John one says that Jesus Christ became flesh and dwelt among us. He identifies with us, so he took on manhood to identify with us. Was born of a virgin. Lived a sinless life, lived a life. And when he says he humbled himself, I want you to imagine, God's given us imagination, just being God and then coming to this earth as a baby, learn how to walk, being at the mercy of adults that you created, can't talk, got to eat the food they put in your mouth whether you like it or not. Then growing up, being just the awkward teens and all that stuff and all the temptations that come with being a young man because scripture tells us in Hebrews Uh, chapter 4, that he was tempted in every way we are, yet was without sin. So he experienced all that goes with being a person, except he didn't give in to the sin by the grace of God and absolute dependence on the Father. So he understands. Then he modeled and lived out everything he asked of us. He never never does and never will ask us to do anything other than above what he modeled and lived out. So then he goes to the cross, and Scripture tells us in Hebrews 12, that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and scorning its shame. There was shame associated with the cross. All sorts of shame. Physical, emotional, spiritual. But for the joy set before him. What was the joy that was set before the Lord Jesus Christ? It was you. I believe this. It was his love for you, whether you believe it or not. It was his love for you, and it was his obedience to the Father, and to live out what was set before him. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. So that you and I can receive his forgiveness because he fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law. He, 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 he did it all because we can't, none of us can meet those demands, those, those requirements of holiness and perfection. Only the Lord Jesus Christ did. So he did it for us. And he took the wrath of God. When he was on, the, I believe the cross, the, the, the physical stuff was, was horrible. My belief is what happened on the cross, the, the exchange of God's wrath far outweighed any of that. And, it was, and none of us will ever know, and I don't think we should. And just thankful that Jesus Christ endured that for your behalf, with you in mind, with me in mind. And even while he's on the cross, he, he lived out forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then not long after that, he's like, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Then he commits his spirit to the Father and he dies. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. And we're gonna, that's why we're going to be celebrating Easter. And he conquered death. And he secured our salvation. And he, he opened up a pathway that we have. We're reconciled to the Father. We're restored to favor with God. Our sins aren't counted against us when we trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he took the punishment for those. That's forgiveness. We've been released. When you're forgiven, you are released from the offense if you'll have it. Or you can pay your own bill and be stubborn and stiff-necked and I did that for a lot of years too. I choose to live on the other side in dependence on God for him to save what I couldn't, to him, for him to forgive and remedy what I could never possibly do and to take a burden that I could not care, carry. So why do we forgive? Why are we, why are we having this conversation about withholding forgiveness, unforgiveness and resentment? Resentment? Because as disciples of Jesus, you're, you're made to forgive. We're forgivers. You've been forgiven much, we're going to forgive much. Forgiveness is hard. It'll kill you. Kill Jesus. I mean, when, I, when I said that Jesus doesn't ask us to do or even command us to do anything that he didn't already model, he forgave us. And he went to the extreme measure of that. And he says, if you're going to follow me and be my disciple, you're going to pick up your cross daily. You know what that cross is? That cross is an instrument of death. It kills us. What does it kill? It kills the flesh. 
It kills that natural man. And when I forgive and I let somebody go, whether they know I forgave them or not, I've forgiven dead people that are long gone, but I've resented and just, and I've just re, I've had to release that to be free. But Jesus did this. He, he's forgiven us. And he's given us the power to forgive. You know, Scripture says in Ephesians, it's the same power that God exerted when he raised Christ from the dead is at work in us right now. It's good to know these things, you guys, because when I know these things, I actually begin to live in that reality, which is the real reality, which is Jesus Christ. So I want to tell you a little bit of story. So what does forgiveness look like as opposed to unforgiveness? You know, about 20 minutes before last service is when I decided to tell this story. You know, I grew up, uh, like a lot of us, we all grew up, right? <clears throat> that was a profound statement. I grew up. Um, oh, no. Maybe he doesn't want to hear about it. <laughs> and as I tell a little bit of a story about myself, I, I, I want to I set a few things up. Every one of you, myself, every one of us, growing up, and if you're in the middle of growing up or even now, life deals out some real painful things. It's hurtful. There's disappointments and there's rejection and there's, there's uh, betrayal and there's hurtful things and there's embarrassment and I can go on and on. And so I, I tell you this because when I was growing up, um, I, I have a brother and a sister and um, our dad was, grew up in Part of my growing up, I know I'm associated with Nebraska, but I've lived everywhere west, where, everywhere west of the Mississippi. And, and at the time, when I was a little boy in kindergarten and a little bit before that, I lived outside a little town called White Swan, Washington, just south of Toppenish on the Yakima Indian Reservation. And my dad worked in the timber field, and in, in, in timber he always did, and he was a hard man. Um, he was an avid drinker and fighter, and he liked to beat on anything, even if it was in his own house. And so I grew up that way. And, uh, um, you know, as the, years, as the years went, you know, I, we ran away when I was nine. That's a whole nother story. But he was not a good man. He was a hard man. He was hard on himself and everybody around him, including his wife and kids. And so, as I grew up, when I was 19, I surrendered my life to Jesus, um, followed him. When I was 20, I went in the, went in the Army. And I remember I got out of the Army uh, when I was 20, 24 or whatever, something like that four years later, so I guess 24. And uh, I went out and visited Dad. He's still on that little farm out there and out, uh, just outside of White Swan. And we we're sitting in the front. He had an old 65 Land Cruiser flatbed. He'd had it since I was a little boy. And we just got done eating this amazing dinner of terrible bear meat. And uh, we're sitting in the, and he always drank Heidelberg beer. And we're sitting in the front of that Land Cruiser that night. And I got up the courage to share Jesus with him. Now, he's only like five foot seven on a good day and about 160 pounds. I could have tossed him around like pizza dough. But in my mind, he's still a hard man. And I got courage up and I shared Jesus with him. And here's what he said. He goes, I was the first one to kick here. I'll be the last one to kick your rear end. Don't ever talk to me about that again. I'm like, okay. And uh, so fast forward. Many, many years, uh, my, my, my dad died about four years, four or five years ago. Um, he had a terrible stroke, ended up in Colorado with my brother and sister, and uh, not long after that, um, in the VA hospital, and uh, my brother eventually led my dad to accept Jesus and, uh, and, and surrender. And he's in the VA hospital the Christmas before he died, and my wife and I were out there, and so if I have, an aver I have an aversion to certain things, and some, one of those things is uh, bodily fluids like slobber, what comes out of the nose, mucusy. I don't even like saying the words. It freaks me out. And, and so, so here I'm in the, in, in the VA hospital, and Dad's there. He was an old vet, and my sister, we're sitting at the table now. He can't talk. He can't say a word. can't use his hands. And uh, my sister's feeding him. I'm watching the food come out of his mouth. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And so we're there all afternoon. My sister got a phone call. She goes, Keith, I got to go. You got to take care of dad. I'm like, and so here I am, and, and I'm feeding him, and it's gross. And I'm looking at his hands, and I had this ridiculous compassion that I didn't even know was in me. I believe this is what the Holy Spirit does. And I had nothing but goodwill towards him. 
and I'm wiping his mouth. I'm putting food back in it. And I did, did that all afternoon. Helped him drink, eat stuff, even put socks on his feet. And I hate feet too. And, and, and especially old, old guy feet that are all gross and stuff. But here, here, here's why I tell you this. Had I not received forgiveness from God and actually experienced it and believed it, I wouldn't have had it to give. And I've been given much, as you have. And, and you and I both, we all have much to give. And forgiveness is one of the main ingredients that we can always give. And it's not easy. Because my dad has done some atrocious things, unspeakable things. To my mom and to myself and to my brothers and sisters. And we've all had hard things. But God has equipped us and empowered us to be forgivers. And there's freedom. And I share that story because forgiveness is not easy and it comes at a cost. And I'm still learning. You know, just, you just even preparing a sermon, I realize there's so many areas that I, I still withhold. And I'm going, oh my goodness. But here's the good, good news. If you're struggling with forgiveness, like you're like, oh, it's a good thing to be struggling with. If you're like, not no, but heck no, I'm not going to. You got a hard heart and uh, you got some work to do. Those of us that are struggling, we still have things to do. And we're going to do it as we depend on the Lord Jesus. As we go back to the, the, to the abide sphere, in, in John 15 is where we get that to abide with Jesus. And Jesus says this, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's including forgiving people. And that's including being forgiven. I think most people, and this has been my experience, and it took me, I've been following Jesus for a little bit, 33, 34 years. I've spent most of my life not believing I was really forgiven. I'm still waiting for the shoe to drop. We're waiting for God to punish me for something. Here's God's heart towards you. I'm going to read uh, Psalm 103, verse 8. It says, The Lord is merciful and gracious. So as I read this, I want you to be thinking about those of you that have surrendered to Jesus, where you were, what God saved you from, what he saved you for, and what he's paid, he paid your debt, he released you from it. This is the God that is merciful, the God that loved my dad and took my dad at his very worst because when he surrendered to Jesus, he couldn't talk. And so what you'd get is a, is a, uh, if a yes was a thumbs up, a no, and he'd flip you the bird. That's how, that's how we talk. And his last words that he spoke when he couldn't speak, my brother said, and my brother prayed with him and said, did you surrender your life to Jesus? And he said, all the way. That was his last words. God took him at his worst. My dad didn't have anything to offer him. He's a broke down, old, cranky, mean guy who Jesus loved and redeemed and saved. And my father's with him right now. The Lord is merciful and gracious. With that in mind, the Lord is merciful and gracious. Slow to anger. God's slow to anger. That might not have been your experience growing up. So you and I will learn to decide I'm not going to judge God based on my past experience. This has been a good, I've been wrestling with this my whole life. God is slow to anger. Abounding with steadfast love. He will not always chide or not always chew you out. Nor will he keep his anger towards you forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins. He doesn't deal with you according to the things you've done wrong. Nor does he repay us according to our iniquities, our misdemeanors, our felonies, our, our, all the stuff that I do that's jacked up and independent of God and resentful. He doesn't deal with me according to that. I want you to hear this, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so is his steadfast love towards those who fear him, for those who respect him, for those who adore him, for those that come to him and know he's their father and he's their God. That's his love for you. It gets better. For as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. He doesn't 
hold that over your head all the time. Maybe some of you are in a relationship right now where you hold the person close to you their mistakes over the head and remind them of the thing they did or the thing they've done. And it might be understandably why you would do that, but that's not forgiving. Maybe you hold those things over your own head and punish yourself for stuff. I, I, I had somebody ask me, what about forgiving myself? And I'm like, well, I don't see anywhere in Scripture. I might get some phone calls on this one, but I haven't found them yet where God tells us to forgive ourselves. Jesus' forgiveness is enough. Will you believe that you are forgiven? And not grind and try to figure out how you're going to forgive yourself. That's not even scriptural. And I'm not going to hang other people's mistakes over their head and remind them. Because you don't need their reminding. They already know this stuff. But that's called resentment and unforgiveness. So what, what does forgiveness look like? So Jesus tells us, tells us a story. So we're going to talk about this. We talk about what forgiveness is. I want, to, I want to tell you a story about what it looks like and what it means for us. Because when Jesus tells these stories, it's always for us to see ourselves in them and see what's available to us and also see <laughs> what the effects of, if I go the other way are. So in Matthew chapter 11, no, chapter 18, Peter's having a conversation with Jesus. I'm just going to story this out. And he asked Jesus, he goes, how often should I forgive somebody? What, seven times or so, ish? And Jesus goes, no, how about 70 times seven or seven, whatever the number is, it's a lot. And he's like, huh. So Jesus says this, he goes, the kingdom of God is like this. He always says this. You need to hear this. You are kingdom people. If you're a Follower of the Lord Jesus, if you're a disciple, the kingdom of God, your new home, your new, is like this. So here's what the kingdom of God is like. And so he tells this story. He goes, there's this uh, king, and he's starting to settle accounts on all the people who owe him whatever they owe him. And he brings this guy in. This guy owes him a super large sum of money that would take a lifetime to repay. And he's like, well, the guy doesn't have it, so he goes, well, I'm going to sell, I'll sell him, his wife and kids, and whatever money I get from that, that'll, that'll settle the debt, but I'm going I'm to sell them off. And the guy begs him not to do this. He goes, please, give me some time. Have mercy on me. I'll pay it. And so the king's like, he has pity on him. He's like, you know what? Forget it. Don't worry about the debt. You're on your own. Your debt's forgiven. I don't know if there's anybody in here who... I've experienced extreme debt, and it's a horrible place to be financially. And uh, if you're one of those people sitting there, or if you've done this, you can get this. What if you had your huge credit card debt, whatever that is, your ridiculous mortgage payment, oh, and your two cars you're making payments on, and the electric bill, all that crazy stuff, and every, every month you're like, I don't think we're going to make it, and when there's another credit card to pay off the credit card. I, I've lived that life, trust me. I speak with great authority. I don't live that life anymore. But... And you wake up one morning, and somebody, you get a thing in the mail that says, you know what, uh, your house paid off, your cars are paid off, your credit card debt's paid off, and you got $250,000 in a, a money market account, and you're forgiven. Your debt's forgiven. What, what, now what do I do? I'm, there's a word for this. It's called free. Well, this guy is free of this debt because the king forgave the debt. So he goes outside. He has no more debt. His kids aren't going to jail. His wife's not going to jail. He actually gets to go home. He's walking down the street, and he sees this guy that owes him about a day's wages. And he comes up to him and starts choking him out. He goes, hey, I want my money now. And the guy goes, ah, I don't have it. He goes, give it to me. I don't have it. Give me some time. He puts him in jail. He's just been forgiven a lifetime worth of debt. And the other servants see this, and they're like, oh, my gosh, this guy's unhinged. Go, they go talk to the king, tell the king what happened. The king calls this guy back and goes, you wicked and evil servant. I forgave you all this. You go out there and treat this guy this way, puts him in prison until he can pay the debt. And then Jesus says this, likewise with the Father. For those who are forgiven much and they don't forgive, likewise like with the Father. You have been forgiven much. So who, 
who, just use your imagination, who do you have in your life right now that you're choking out? That you resent? That you haven't been honest with? That you haven't forgiven and you've built a case against them in your mind? And I told you earlier when we started, I'm not condemning anybody. I've lived this and I'm still working it out too. So we're in this together and God's given us everything. When he says, I've given you everything you need for life and godliness, he's given us what we need to live this out as we depend on him and abide with him. So why should I forgive? I want to I share with you, I, I, I read a paper, I was looking online, and I read a paper from the University of Pennsylvania on the effects of unforgiveness and forgiveness. Purely secular, has nothing to do with the Bible, it's just a physiological impact of forgiveness and unforgiveness. Here's what, here's what forgiveness, it says, it, 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 here's what it says forgiveness is. It's a character strength and process. Forgiveness is a process. I might forgive Jana, and then a month later, I'm like, I don't forgive her anymore. I got to go back and do it. It, it can be a process, because some of the hurts are, are hurtful, and, but it is a process. So here's what, here's what forgiveness does. It improves psychological well-being, physical health, and longevity. Who would have thought? It's more for you than the person you're forgiving. You're free. You're not carrying that stuff around. You're not punishing people. You're not building your little, yeah, you just, it's better. And guys, as I'm doing this, I, I'm, I'm in my own mind too. Here's what else uh, forgiveness says. It serves as a protective agent against poor health and psychological consequences. This is all secular scientific medical study. And, and you can, the footnotes of the paper are in there. You can go look it up online. It serves as a protective, a protective against poor health. The benefits of forgiveness are most significant to the one who has been hurt. Me forgiving my dad. I have forgiven people that don't even... No, and they don't even receive, they wouldn't even receive it. I never forgave my dad to his face because he would have, yeah, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have, wouldn't have mattered. But I've released him in my heart. I don't think ill of him. There's people in my life that are dead that I have forgiven. There's no way I could tell them. And I'm always in the process of being a forgiver and receiving it. Here's some unforgiveness. Is the, here's what it is. It's the practice of engaging in rheumatative thoughts of anger, vengeance, hate, and resentment. Resentment. And unproductive outcomes of unforgiveness. Here's what they are. This is amazing. Increased anxiety. Increased anxiety. Depression. Elevated blood pressure, vascular resistance, decreased immune response, and coronary artery disease. They'll kill you. And these people aren't even talking about Jesus. This is going, here's our studies. These people are unforgiving and resentful. This is the stuff that's showing up after we've studied all these people. They're not trying to preach a sermon appealing to you to be forgivers. They're going, this stuff will kill you. I love freedom. I love to have the freedom to go to God. I love to have the freedom to be in a relationship with people. I love the freedom of not having to hide stuff. I love the freedom of being able to talk to a person and go, man, this is where you hurt me, or I think I hurt you, and work those things out. And they're painful at the time. But there's a freedom, and the only place I can get that is as I trust God, I depend on him, have these conversations with him, and then in his power I actually have that sort of relationship with other people. There's a freedom. I'm not carrying a bunch of baggage around. I don't say that with arrogance. It's actual, actual humility. And sometimes I do carry the baggage around, but I have people in my life that can see it as well. And I don't carry it long. And God is patient with me. We just read that in Psalms 108. So here's where I want to go. I want to finish up with this. Why should I forgive? I wrote down some things. You're not going to see them on the screen. I just got some thoughts here in your notes. Uh, forgiveness, here's what forgiveness brings. And just whatever it brings, just know this. Unforgiveness is the very opposite of that. 
Forgiveness brings healing. It heals my heart, my mind, and my soul. And it gives me rest. Have you ever just been so upset about a hurt? And some, again, these hurts, and some of these hurts are legitimate, painful, agonizing, terrifying hurts. And they keep me up at night, and I'm just, I, I'm, I'm mad at God, or I'm mad at the person, or I'm mad at myself because I can't. There's no rest. Forgiveness, as we trust God through this process, when it finally goes, there's rest that comes with that and healing. Forgiveness brings provision. The opposite of provision is lack. And this provision that forgiveness provides is relational abundance and rest. I can have relationship with people when, they're, when we've forgiven. I mean, just the folks I get to work with on staff, we all, a lot of us have had plenty of time to hurt each other, step on each other's toes, be completely stupid, miss it, whatever, and we work these things out. And those same people who I work with every day and I love, and they're sometimes I don't even like them or they don't like me, but we've forgiven and we work this out because that's what we're made to do. I've been married for 29 years. My wife and I have missed it. I've hurt her. She's hurt me. And we've forgiven. And once we forgive, we don't bring it up unless it helps somebody. And we have relational abundance. The opposite of that is relational deficit and isolation. Forgiveness provides freedom. Freedom from resentment. Uh, when I get, for me, I get that resentment's all about me. And what's been done to me, 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 and oh, me as well. And again, I'm not mocking. I understand resentment, but as a disciple of Jesus, it has no place. It has to have, when I notice it, it needs to be gone because it's a poison. Lastly, forgiveness brings authority. Brings you authority. The authority to model, teach, and disciple others how to forgive and how to live forgiven. So as a disciple of Jesus, one who follows, one who's being changed, one who's on mission, if I'm in a, in a relationship with people, and especially somebody, it's a discipling relationship, how are they going to know how to forgive? As somebody that knows Jesus, uh, had just accepted Jesus when they're 60-some years old, or they're 35, and they've got all these terrible life experiences, and they've spent their whole life, their fuel has been anger and mistrust and survival. They're not going to read it in a book and get it, and it's not going to be in a little class and fill in the blank thing. They're going to have to learn it as they experience it with somebody. So when we're in groups together, that's why they're so hard, because we bring all our junk. And it give, it's a practice field to learn to forgive. It really is. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. Sounds good in the sermon or on the whiteboard until you're in those trials of many kinds. But it's building something in us. And I believe this, the church is the answer for the problems in this world. When the church is lived out under the power and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, and as we give way and yield, God uses that. And there's authority in that. We're not authority to lord over people, but to live this out. So what are our next steps? I don't know what your next step is. Who are you resenting right now? You guys know. Who are you with un withholding unforgiveness? Maybe they're alive. Maybe they don't even want to talk. Maybe you can't talk to them, but you can still forgive them. Who do you have in your life that you can talk to that will help you do this? You have the, you have the Father. You can go to the Father. You, you can pray. But that's why we do stuff in groups. There's some things I can't do on my own. I don't have the courage to. But I need people to encourage me and help me. So your next step this, this week and for the rest of your life, that's a big step. As Father, this is what I prayed earlier this week, I've been praying as Father, where am I being resentful? Who do I need to forgive, whether they receive it or not? I had somebody ask me last service, what if I forgive somebody and they just laugh at me and they, they don't want my forgiveness? That's, well, that's terrible. But you can still forgive them, whether they want it or not. Forgiveness does not guarantee reconciliation. But unforgiveness guarantees no reconciliation. I guarantee you that. So your next step, ask God. And we're, I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to worship. Here's the other thing forgiveness does. We can actually worship with our hair on fire, or our heads on fire. We can actually mean it and be thankful. And if you're in that process of forgiving, that's okay. 
And if you drop the ball, pick it, stay the course. Run the race marked out for you. So, Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, Thank you. Thank you for setting us free from our own destruction, our own sin and rebellion and arrogance and all that stuff. You, and thank you, Lord Jesus, that you paid for that and you took the wrath of God and you did for us what we can't do for ourselves. And your word tells us that all the righteous requirements of the law were met in you. So Holy Spirit, will you burden us as your church myself, I'm asking for myself, where I'm not forgiving, where I'm resentful, expose that, and I offer that to you, and I'm going to go to the people I need to go to. And that we as a church would do that, and that we as a church would be free to be your disciples, and to worship you, and to love others, and to love ourselves, and be, live in your forgiveness. Holy Spirit, we need help with our faith. I need, to, I need help believing what's true about you, and what you say is true about me and others. And that we would love what you love, and that we would value what you value. We submit to you, and I know for me an act of worship is just giving you my junk. So, Father, we need your help. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for not giving up on us. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us online today. We will be continuing communion and finishing up service in just a moment. We pray today's service was challenging, encouraging, and motivational. We hope you'll visit one of our three campuses soon. We'd love to meet you in person and give you and your family a small gift of appreciation. For more information about Real Life, upcoming events, and connecting with our community, please visit reallifeministries.com. Come join us and help us impact our community, our nation, and the world for Jesus, one person at a time. praying for those who are who are lost who are far from God and those who are hurting and maybe you are hurting right now even based on this topic that you've been reminded of some some hurt in your life those that you've struggled to forgive and there's no easy answers for those I pray that right now that you you would seek God that you would ask him what you would do with this message how you would respond to him and his working in your life you'd be reminded of what God has forgiven you as you consider what next step you would have. Let's pray right now for those who are lost and hurting and those we need to maybe forgive.
love that we get to pause and just reflect on what God has been doing in each of us as we reflect on our story, what we've been forgiven, the relationships we have, and and what God's challenging us to do. I think it's perfect that we would kind of come to this point in our service where we would take communion together to remember what our God has done for us. The great distance, the debt that was paid in sending Jesus, in Jesus' death, the payment for our sin on the cross. We remember that. We, we never get too far from that in our faith. I love the visual that, that Keith gave us of when our financial debt, if it were to be paid, if someone was to come in and just pay off all financial debt and even bless us with abundance, that feeling, we can all just feel it, right? The relief. And how much more is that sin debt worth? That we have a hope, not just in this life, in in things like finances, but we have hope in eternal life. That God has given us that, that hope of eternal perspective. And that's what we pause to remember is that that Jesus took that pain, sin to the cross. That that's the center of our faith, that we remember what he did for us. What Jesus did for us, and and the reminder when he was in the upper room with his disciples, and one of those disciples was about to betray him, and he still broke that bread with his disciples in the upper room. He said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take that together. the same way he took the cup this cup is a new covenant between God and man as often as you do this do this in remembrance of me God we're just humbled and grateful that that debt has been paid for all of us who call upon your name who claim you as Lord God that we've been given an eternal hope God, that you've given us the confidence to have that relationship with you. God, I'm praying for all those maybe in the room and those who we know at a distance who don't have that, that same hope. God, that you would draw them near. They'd be able to feel that freedom of what you've done. You've released them from that bondage because of your son. God, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue to respond right now. We're going to do that through lifting our voices in worship. And there's lots of ways that you can respond during this time. There's, there's people that are going to be available to pray with you. Uh, underneath our screens, we're going to have a prayer team. We also have our elders available directly upstairs by the offices. They'd love to pray with you. They'd love to just bring those needs and pray over you. Maybe you made a decision today. We would love to know about those decisions. You can do that on the app. You can do that through the boxes or better yet, come and talk with someone. But this is our chance to respond to what God has been doing in our heart. We can say to him, God, you have been amazing. You've done miracles in my life and I praise you despite the challenges. So right now, let's worship. Would you stand?
that there was truly no other way by which we could be resolved, be absolved of our sins, no way to access you and nothing we could do on our own. And God, you made a way while we were still your enemies. We thank you for that. And God, we know that as we choose and learn to follow and live the way that you've told us to, that there is a blessing attached, that we get to see that blessing in our family for the generations, for the legacy that we leave. And that blessing is not just something for us to hoard, but it's for us to bless others, for us to be an example that through the way that we live and love that the whole world would know who you are. Jesus, we thank you. Let's sing this together. Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace sing that again Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Sing amen.
Isn't it encouraging that that's the God that we have? That he is for us, that he's with us in all the painful situations that happen in our life. We talked about forgiveness, that God is right there with us. And we need that. How many people do you know don't have that same kind of hope? Don't have this God with you. God with us. And this Easter might be that opportunity. It's been a hard year. This might be the year that they would join you for church. We have these invites all around campus. Grab one of these. Be praying right now about who God would have you join you for Easter that needs that hope, that needs that forgiveness, that needs that debt to be paid. Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for the reminder of what you have forgiven. Everything. God, that the hope we have is eternal. You have paid that debt, that we have this this hope, that we have an anchor for our soul. We're so grateful of this reminder. We're thankful for the forgiveness, but God, we pray that you'd give us the courage to know what to do with this, who you would help us to restore relationship with, to reach out to. God, that, that your love and grace would overflow from us. And that would be an evident to the world of the hope that we have, of the faith we have in you. God, thank you for today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Have a great day. Say hi to someone on the way out.